Hey, I'm Terry Crooks from the Libby Church of Christ, and thank you for joining us. This is part two on dying and death and what's all that about. So last week we uh, did a kind of an intro on death, the reality of it. We really tried to talk about how it's something we're not going to escape, bottom line. Uh, we're not going to get out of this thing alive. That's really the short of it. And really the short of it is that our lives are very short. And so it's important for us to talk about dying and keep it before us because the whole point of Jesus coming and dying for us so we could live eternally with him. The reason Christians get together on the first day of the week and take the Lord's Supper is to celebrate that Jesus died for them. Acts 20 and 7, we note that. And also Matthew 26, it was commanded by God. And 1 Corinthians 11, the details of all what the Lord's Supper and the resurrection, the death of Jesus means with us. And so it's important for us to be people who look, plan for the future because our lives are so short. Uh, we talked about Psalms, three score and 10, except by measure of strength. And so 70 is pretty good for a person. In America, we can live almost to 80 on the average uh, due to the medical wonders that we are enjoying in life. But it's important for us to plan for the future. And so we talked about who am I, and we are individuals created in the image of God, but sin entered the world through Adam and Eve, and we sin, and as a result of that, our sin separates from God. We find that passage in uh, Romans 3, 23, and the wages of sin is death. And so it's important for us to accept the responsibility of our sin in our life. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, that separates us from God. And so Jesus is the answer. He came and he paid the price for our sins. And so even though sin entered by one man, salvation came through the one man, Jesus Christ, Romans chapter 5. And since we sin, we suffer the same fate that Adam and Eve suffered when they sinned in the garden, ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's so important for us. And in God's eternal plan, Ephesians chapter 3, even before the foundation of the earth, his plan was to establish his church. And that is so important because that understanding gives us the understanding we get from that passage is that God had a plan even before Adam and Eve sinned. And so sometimes we want to blame Adam and Eve for the problem, but the reality is all of us sinned. And we would have done the same thing they would. We fall in the same traps. And so it's important for us to accept the responsibility of our sins. Individuals created for another time, another place, because this is not what life is all about. This is just the beginning. Real life is yet to come. Second Corinthians chapter 5. And so let's talk about uh, our mission. What are we supposed to do here? Our mission you know, it's our tendency as humans that we kind of live and do whatever we want to do. This is our playground. You know, we got uh, so many days to work and weekends, hours and whatever. You know, we do our thing. There's a guy in the book of uh, the Old Testament, the book of Ecclesiastes, who thought that too, that it was all about him. And we have that tendency if we're not careful. But to what he had and the advantage he had that we don't have, he was an extremely wealthy guy. And so you name it, he had it. He tried to find happiness in his horses, and he tried to find happiness in the things that he built. He tried to find happiness in his marriage, and so he tried out a thousand wives, 700 wives and 300 concubines. You know, you'd think in all of that he could have found a woman that he thought was the answer, but that didn't work either. So any pleasure that he would seek, he gave himself to it. And all through the book of Ecclesiastes, he is so disappointed. It is such a downer for him as he realizes there is nothing here I can keep. Everything is temporary. I'm going to live my life and I'm going to leave everything that I've done really outstanding to some fool is going to come along and not even appreciate it. And so he gave, he gave, this, he gave this tremendous testimony or account in the first 11 chapters into chapter 12 about how difficult it was. And then in chapter 12, he talks about growing old. He had lived through all this stuff. He'd enjoyed all these things. And he talks about his body falling apart. You know, his arms are weak and his knees are hurting him. And, uh, and he is, his voice is squeaky and his hair is turning gray and his eyes can hardly see. And then he talks about his death. And he says, and the spirit of man then returns to the, to, returns to the dust while, excuse me, the body returns to the dust while the spirit returns to God who gave it. Catch that again. Our spirits return to God who gave it, and our bodies return to dust. And so he looked at all of that, and he said, you know, what, what have I done? In verse 13 and 14 of that 12th chapter, he said, the whole duty of man is fear God and keep his commandments. Bottom line, that is what it's all about. 
We need to fear God and keep his commandments. It is so important we put things in perspective. It's a tremendously different picture when we look at Job because Job relates to life, understanding that God is really in control. You remember all of his temptations came upon him because Satan was talking to God and said, you know, you just bought Satan off. You just bought Job off. And uh, Job was such an outstanding individual. And so the trials come on Job and he never gives up on the Lord. He is steadfast all the way through all of his trials. He does everything he can do to be right. And his three friends who show up and they start putting pressure on him that you got to be a sinner, you got to be wrong. God wouldn't let this happen to you if you were not a bad guy. And he comes down to chapter 14 and he says, if a man dies, will he live again? And he talks about that, how God is security and God will keep him whole and God will call him and he will respond. And so he had some understanding there of the resurrection that is so important for us to understand. There are some things that's also repeated all through the book of Genesis. When Abraham and Isaac and Jacob would die and others, it says, and they were gathered to their fathers. They were gathered to their people. And so we see that picture of individuals who understood that when we die, we go to a place where all of God's people or all people are gathered, good and evil. We look at that in Luke chapter 16 in the rich man and Lazarus. And sometimes people take that Bible passage there out of context and say that it's a parable when Jesus said it's, it is a real story. There was a guy named Abraham, he says that, and there's a guy named Lazarus, he says that, and there's this rich guy, and all of these are players in the story. He just didn't make up a story and give real names to people and say, let me tell you a story and take real people and give them, uh, tell about something that didn't happen. That would be lying. And so we got the situation in Luke chapter 16, there's this a poor guy named Lazarus who is a servant of God who doesn't have anything. And there's this rich guy who's got it all. And Lazarus, poor guy, he just he was dying. And he wished he just had some of the crumbs of the rich man. But he didn't have anything, and he dies. And he is taken by the angels into the bosom of Abraham. He's taken to a place called paradise, and there he is comforted. And the rich man, he's still hanging out on earth, doing his thing, not serving God. And when he dies, he opens his eyes in a place of torment, and he looks across and he sees Abraham there and he sees Lazarus there. And he says to Abraham, hey, send, send Lazarus over. You know, the, you know, the guy who had nothing, the guy who would, who would be uh, at his gate just wishing he had some food. Send him over so he can just, you know, cool my tongue. Just ditch, dip his finger in some water. My tongue is on fire. And Abraham tells him, you know, there's a great chasm that he cannot cross over from here to you. And then the rich man says, well, let's, let's add plan B here. Send him back to warn my brothers not to come to this terrible place. And so he knows his brothers are on their way. And Abraham tells him, if they're not going to listen to Moses and the prophets, they're not going to listen even if somebody comes back from the grave. And so we see several things in, in that story there. The reality is that Lazarus opened his eyes and he was in comfort. The reality that the rich man opened his eyes and he was in torment. Both of these real-time players, Abraham, real-time player there in the place of comfort, and there is no going back and forth. There is no separation. There's nobody coming back from that world and saying, hey, you know, you need to be paying attention because if people are going to listen to God. They're not going to listen to the scriptures. They're not going to listen even if somebody came back from the grave. And we see that in the scriptures very clearly. Jesus was resurrected from the dead, and how many people didn't accept him when he was there on the earth? How many people didn't accept all the other individuals that he raised from the dead? We get another picture of a guy named uh, Lazarus earlier, remember, in the last discussion there. When Lazarus was raised from the dead, you remember what happened with Lazarus is that the Jewish leaders then took out a contract on Lazarus's life because the testimony of Lazarus's resurrection was so powerful. They had to stop that. Their minds were closed. They were on their own course. They were doing their own things. And even if God got in his, their way, they were going to take him out of the equation. And that's exactly what they did. And so it's important for us to understand that we're very temporary in this life, that we've got a mission in this life, and that we need to turn our hearts and turn our minds to God and be individuals who serve him. We've talked much about Matthew chapter 6, that in this world we worry about what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, what we're wearing, we worry about all this other stuff. In America, we're, all, you know, we're beyond that. We're worried about all of our pleasures and what we're going to do. Oh, sometimes it's a struggle. But the reality of 
of all of that worrying is God says that's what pagans do, not realizing that God feeds the birds of the air and takes care of everything else. And our whole duty is to seek and serve God, that if we'll seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, he'll provide for us and he'll take care of us. We need to be, we must be people who turn and serve God and not get so obsessed with our own lives and the own, the own thing, our own things, the things that we're doing, that we lose track of life and we lose our mission in life. And so as people who believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, we understand that in the book of Acts, there's salvation found in no other name. When the Jewish leaders were telling the apostles, don't teach any longer in the name of Jesus, they would say, we can't help but talk about the things that we have seen and heard, and that salvation is only found in his name. Jesus said, if we'll confess his name before men, he'll confess our name for the Father in heaven. Jesus says, if we don't repent of our sins and turn and follow him, we will die in our sins. Jesus said, if we believe with all of our heart that he is the Son of God, that we can have salvation, John 3, 16. But it says we should have salvation. And it all comes back down to having the quality of faith that James talked about, the book of Hebrews talks about, that we will do whatever God wants us to do. There'll be a lot of people who will show up in eternity with Lazarus and with the rich man. Guys with Lazarus who were obedient to God and served God first and the world wasn't their focus. There'll be a lot of guys like the rich man who missed their opportunity because they failed to acknowledge that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, or God was the leader of their life, the Lord and Savior, and they lived their own life to serve themselves. Many people, Jesus says in that situation, most people, Jesus says in John chapter 7, will be lost. And only a few people will prioritize him as the primary subject of their life, that they will follow him, they will give their lives to him, they'll love him with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, and with all their strength, and they will follow after him. People will say in eternity, Lord, we did all these wonderful things in your name. You know, we cast out demons. We did this. We did that. Matthew chapter 7. But Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Our salvation must be linked directly with the salvation of Jesus Christ. We are spiritual creatures, number one, born to live eternally. God breathed into us his life. We are created in his image. We are put here to serve him and to give our lives to him, to be buried with him by baptism and raised to live a new life with him, covered with his blood so that we can live with him eternally. And so it's important for us to understand where we are going. The rich man and Lazarus had different endings. Lazarus understood what the answer was and he put God first in his life and he received salvation. When the rich man was so focused on this world that he's involved with, he lost everything that was important to him, and he realized his brothers were going to lose it too. Let's follow Jesus. Jesus came and purchased his church with his blood. In Acts chapter 20, it talks about that. And if the church of Jesus is so important that he purchased the church with his blood, what should the church mean to us? What should his word mean to us? We need to be people who realize that our lives are short. Three, three score and ten if we're fortunate. Sometimes people don't even make it that, that far. Lots of teenagers die young. Lots of people never make it to be married. Lots of people never fulfill their dreams. Lots of people almost get to the point that they're ready to retire and they die. But lots of people live their life clear to the end, but miss what is most important, and that is the relationship with God and with Jesus Christ. Let's be people who see through the maze of life and not get distracted with those things that are immediately before us and turn our lives over to Jesus, become his disciples, being buried with him by baptism into his death in the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit, Matthew 28, 18, and 19, and let's walk with him. Let's be the people he would have us be. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the blessing of this day, and thank you for watching over us. And help us to always remember life comes from you, and life can only be found in you. Help us commit our hearts and our minds to you, and help us be obedient. Help us to be people of faith, and don't just talk about loving you, but truly implement love in our lives. In your son's name we pray. Amen. 
Lord willing, next week we'll come back and we're going to be talking about, okay, after we die, where do we go? 